For the occasion of my 100th video, I created a special Stalker Iceberg, and I said I would explain its elements eventually. Last time we already covered the first layer, and now it's time to continue. Hello Stalkers and welcome to the Anomalous Dugout. In this video we will take a look at the second layer of my Stalker Iceberg, the Basement. The Best Leader of Freedom In Pripyat, there is a stash named Supplies of the Leader of Freedom. The description says, The last that they knew about him is that he was the sole survivor after the Scorcher. He left all the supplies in some old supermarket and moved on out. Everything went not the way it was planned and that was the best leader of freedom in all of our history. So according to this information, a commander of the freedom faction, along with his squad, managed to get past the brain scorcher and into Pripyat. However, all the men were killed, except for the leader who made the stash and left. By talking to NPCs in Pripyat and the Red Forest, it is actually possible to learn more about this mysterious leader and his deeds. Loners will confirm that the man and his squad somehow bypassed the Scorcher, and even crazier, they managed to survive for a whole month in Pripyat. Even Dutiers will acknowledge this and show some respect towards the achievement. As for the Freedomers themselves, they will reveal two more things. The first is the name of the so-called best leader, Mikluha. The second is the fact that all the members of Mikluha's team survived their four weeks adventure. In the end, it's hard to say what is truth and what is legend, since the stash description said that only Mikluha himself survived, but this obscure character nonetheless remains a real badass of the zone. As to how he managed to bypass the Brain Scorcher, this has probably something to do with the Psy device's cooling cycles. There are several documents and dialogues from both Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky, explaining that Psy emitters work with cycles. At some times they are at full power, and at other times they are much less dangerous because they need to cool down. Because Freedom was living next to the barrier, they were probably able to figure out the times when the Brain Scorcher was cooling down and Mikluha used this opportunity to sneak past the monolith forces guarding the way to Pripyat. Drivable BTR Did you know that the ability to drive cars was not completely cut from the game? Allow me to demonstrate. At the CNPP, get close to a BTR and spam the use key. Eventually, you will manage to enter the vehicle. Once inside, I suggest using the second or third person camera, or else you won't see anything. Then you need to turn on the engine. I'm not sure what the default button is for this, so what you can do is open the command console and type bind turn underscore engine KB. This will bind the action to turn on the engine to your B key which normally should not be used for anything else. Finally, press B to start the engine, press the spacebar to release the brakes, and you are free to drive. Let's go! So, the BTR is not easy to drive, because the controls are not the best and most of all, it will easily get stuck in all the debris and other crap laying around in the map. Also, the external camera is kinda awkward, and you cannot use the gun in the turret. This one is still trying to fire at you, actually. But if you can overcome these obstacles, driving around the CNPP in a BTR can be pretty fun. Keep in mind that the vehicle is not indestructible, and it may be destroyed. 
I noticed that crashing into walls in particular deals a lot of damage to the BTR. It's not really practical or useful to utilize this trick, however it's still an incredibly interesting relic of the planned vehicle mechanics that were removed during development. Bloodsucker Shrine The so-called Bloodsucker Village is one of the most haunted places in the games, be it in Shadow of Chernobyl or Clear Sky. Besides the terrifying bloodsuckers, the area is also full of corpses, including monolithians and special forces. However, the most disturbing sight in the whole place is without a doubt the contraption known as the Bloodsucker Shrine. It consists of a large tree on rocks, at the bottom of which dead men and cut limbs have been placed around the campfire. Weirdly enough, a stalker suit can be found at the center of the location. It is obvious that such an arrangement is not natural and was made by an intelligent being. Moreover, we can note that the shrine was not present in clear sky, despite the existence of the tree and many corpses scattered nearby. Therefore, a popular theory is that bloodsuckers built the contraption as some sort of altar or who knows what else. If true, this may indicate that bloodsuckers are much more intelligent than what they show in game. It is also possible that the shrine was made by other mutants, such as controllers. Meanwhile, others believe that the altar is actually man-made. The area around the tree was occupied by mercenaries in clear sky. Could it be that they set up this terrifying scene before leaving? Maybe. If the shrine's purpose is to scare stalkers away, perhaps it has something to do with the heads on spikes that can be found in many places throughout the zone. These are located in great numbers at the barrier and on the way to the radar, which probably means that they were placed by the monolith faction to mark their territory and discourage any from entering it. Finally, I need to mention Sin, a cut faction that was supposed to appear in the army warehouses. It is rumored that the dark stalkers of the Sin faction are performing rituals including human sacrifices and cannibalism. So even though they were removed from the game, I think the Bloodsucker Shrine fits their theme perfectly. Quartet Quartet is a code name used by the military to designate their commander, most notably during the raid on the power plant named Operation Monolith. At the CNPP, the player's PDA will intercept military comms and you will be able to hear the name Quartet a lot. On a dead body, you can find information about the operation. In the file, the name Quartet is clearly stated to be the commander and it is even shown where to find him on the map. So, let's go meet him, shall we? There he is, somehow completely undefended. The NPC himself doesn't have anything special, but a lot of nice equipment can be found around the camp. Furthermore, there is a special line of military dialogue that plays right before the blowout starts, confirming Quartet's death and the beginning of the panic for the remaining troops. Interestingly enough, some of the same voice comms 
used at the CNPP can also be heard at the beginning of the Acroprom mission, and Quartet is once again mentioned. This is most likely a mistake, or an oversight made by the devs, but the fact that they made such a cool voice acting for the army in the first place is, in my opinion, already wonderful. Scorcher's Scrapyard Around the bar it is possible to get a strange dialogue from one of the random NPCs. Nobody has managed to get through the vehicle scrapyard because of the brain scorcher. Some people did see a stalker go through the invisible border, fall over, then get up in a couple of minutes and head straight for the center of the scrapyard. He ain't been seen since. The last part describes what happened to a stalker who went too close to the brain scorcher. He fell on the ground, stayed down for a few minutes, then got back up and continued his way in the forbidden area. Maybe this precisely describes how people are zombified, or perhaps how they are recruited in the monolith faction. But for now, I'd like to focus more on the location where this scene happened, the vehicle scrapyard. It appears that this scrapyard is a place found somewhere on the way to the center of the zone, around the border that marks the territory of the brain scorcher. While we do not see this area in game, I believe that the dialogue refers to the old radar map that was originally supposed to appear instead of the red forest that we got on release. In the old version, which can be found in some builds and mods, the forest area featured before the antennas did not exist, replaced by a large scrapyard with heaps of trash similar to garbage. However, can this really be called a vehicle scrapyard? Because we can't see much rusted vehicles around, it is still possible that the vehicle scrapyard mentioned by NPCs is, in reality, another unknown location. Well, this remains a mystery for now. Balaklava Soldier A lot of stalkers in the zone can be seen wearing balaclavas, However, it is very likely that you've never seen a military guy with one. Yet, there exists a mysterious and unique NPC, a soldier who actually wears such a mask. This rare character can sometimes be found among the troops raiding the bandit base in the Dark Valley, right after the player exits Lab X-18 with the secret documents. Truth be told, I was not able to encounter him in my game during the making of this video, but thankfully our good friend Uncle Coin did, and he provided a few valuable screenshots. I'm not sure why I could not meet him, but it may be because his spawn rate is very low, or because of problems linked to the game's version, who knows. In any case, the name of this peculiar soldier appears to be randomly generated, and the only thing we learn about him is his rank, Sergeant. Of course, it does not end there. In the information recovered from Nimble at the beginning of the game, we get a stolen picture of the military personnel during Operation Agroprom. In this picture, we can spot another Balaklava soldier next to an officer. Is this the same person? I believe it is, not only because this is the only soldier that looks like this, but also because it would make total sense. Indeed, if this soldier was part of the investigation team at Agroprom, he was one of the grunts who discovered the existence of Laboratory X-18. Shortly after this, the military continued its investigation by raiding the said lab and the area around it, the Dark Valley. My theory is that this masked soldier was tasked to discover the secrets of the zone, starting at Agroprom and then following the lead to the Dark Valley. 
Perhaps this guy was even part of the SBU, the Ukrainian secret services, hiding his true identity from his fellow soldiers using his mask. Maybe a friend of Major Dektairev? I guess we'll never know. Cordon Tunnel Zombie In Shadow of Chernobyl, there is a veteran bandit with some unique dialogues located in the garbage. To see it for yourself, you need to keep this bandit alive and join the Freedom Faction. That way you will be able to talk to him. If you are confused about how to join the Freedom Faction, first of all, yes, it is possible in vanilla Shadow of Chernobyl. And second of all, I made a video specifically about that. Link in the description. I was also told that the duty or captive from the bandits in the Dark Valley will provide the same dialogue after he's been rescued, but I can't say for sure. Anyway, the dialogue in question refers to the cordon, and there it is mentioned that in the small tunnel under the embankment, it is sometimes possible to quote land a date with some zombies. Despite this, the tunnel will never contain any zombies. Unless the corpses that can be found inside used to be zombies. Another possibility is that the developers had planned to put the so-called civilian zombies in the tunnel before this enemy was removed from the game. You see, originally there were supposed to be two types of zombies. The normal zombies, which have been cut, who had no weapons and acted like living corpses. And the zombified stalkers, who are able to use firearms and that are still found in the games. According to a popular theory, the normal zombies are zombified stalkers who have decayed over time losing more and more of their cognitive abilities, and thus becoming unable to use any weapons. If this is correct, there is a chance that the dead bodies found in the tunnel are zombies who stayed there for too long and ended up rotting here. In fact, some models of the cut zombies can still be seen in some areas, most notably hanging from trees in Rostock. It is unknown if these are supposed to be the decomposed corpses of former stalkers that were put there as a warning, or if these are indeed zombies. In any case, we currently don't know the truth about the zombified stalkers' longevity. Are they able to survive for a long time without food and without decaying even more? Or do they truly lose more and more of their humanity as time goes on? Make sure to tell me your opinion in the comments below. And that's gonna do it for the second layer. I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, be sure to stay tuned for the next episode, in which we will review the third layer, the underground. Good hunting, stalkers.